Welcome to the Bob Allen Southcast, episode number 449, Concerns Regarding Long-Term Testosterone Pellets for Women. BioBalance Health features conversations about anti-aging medicine. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about testosterone replacement therapy for women, and Got Testosterone, the newly released book for men that helps men choose the most effective and safe form of T replacement. These books are available on Amazon or from Dr. Moffin's office at BioBalance Health in St. Louis and in Kansas City. Dr. Moffin's office is currently accepting new patients. In the last number of weeks, we have done a couple of health casts regarding short-term concerns for people who become testosterone pellet patients. These are, as we presented the information, they are short-lived. The concerns occur, if they occur at all, they occur and they are resolved. But what we've learned over time is that there are some concerns that continue to be in the awareness of women who are getting testosterone pellets. For some women, these concerns manifest and become real problems, symptoms, issues that have to be dealt with. And for others, there's an anxiety about them, but they don't experience them. Nothing happens. It's not really common, but the concern is common. People hear about it. They, they hear the horror stories mm-hmm. and they say, oh, what if that happens to me? And so they ask for reassurance. Mm-hmm. Will this happen to me? If it does happen to me, what can you do about it? And so we thought we would spend some time today talking about what those longer term awarenesses are and what we know about those as issues for women mm-hmm. and what we can do to protect women against them. So Good idea. <laughs> where do you want to start? Well, um, facial hair and facial acne. hair and acne is the most common. Right. So when patients come in to see me uh, and they are candidates for testosterone replacement, I discuss the biggest complaint that I get or everyone gets when they uh, prescribe testosterone of any kind, and that is that women get facial hair and acne. Now, not every woman gets facial hair, not every woman gets acne, but people who used to have facial hair before they were 40-something and people who used to have acne when they were a teenager often are the people that get facial hair and acne it's on almost like testosterone. like your body's predisposed to that condition. Right, and and, and I'll, I'm going to step back for a second and say all of these um, – later concerns, concerns that happen after the first four months, are concerns that have to do with a patient's sensitivity to testosterone, their inborn genetic sensitivity, their receptor sites. It's not about how much testosterone you have, it's how much, how many receptors you have and how sensitive they are. So a lot of women are not very re- sen- uh, testosterone sensitive, so they never get facial hair or acne. So do estrogen and testosterone use the same receptor sites? Can they access the yes. cell through those sites? So for women who make so much more estrogen, they may not have had a concern with receptor sites un- until their testosterone went away? Um, most am I women, saying that backwards? Most, most women have more testosterone than estrogen. Okay, when they're young. Okay. And and we replace it that way. We replace more testosterone than estrogen. So we try to get them back to the same ratio of more testosterone. It's three times as much testosterone as estradiol. But these two hormones do compete at the receptor site. Mm -hmm. So when we're giving testosterone that's going to last four months, we actually have to think, how much estrogen am I giving and how much testosterone am I giving? If I give a lot of estrogen, it will then stick to the receptor sites, it's more sticky than the testosterone is. So it'll bump the testosterone off. So you won't feel your testosterone. Right. And you'll just feel your estrogen. So oftentimes we have to start with a low estrogen and a medium testosterone and see how that works. But for side effects, if you have a lot of estrogen, you don't get as much facial hair. But but as a physician, when you're dealing with this whole question of balancing receptor mm -hmm. sites, there's no known test no. that identifies receptor sites or the fluidity of the receptor sites. Or how sensitive they are to testosterone or estrogen. So you can only tell by <laughs> trial and effect. Right. I so, only can look at blood levels, but blood levels may not mean anything because 
One person may be very sensitive to testosterone and I give them a little bit of, uh, of testosterone and they get lots of facial hair and acne. And then another person is resistant to testosterone right. and they don't get any of that side effect. Right. So I have to watch for those signs after I've given the testosterone and be aware of that and then change dose depending on what patients tell me. Now, one thing I do like to do for facial hair and acne is I like to prescribe something for my patients who have had facial hair and acne in the past. Right. And you say, this may happen again. And this may happen again. And I tell all of them it may happen. It's possible. Right. Uh, even really light blonde people can get fuzzy and they don't like that. So, I mean, it's possible. It's not like dark hair, but they don't like it, ha it uh, occurring. So I, I tell them that they might get facial hair and acne. And if they'd like to prevent that, they can take something called spironolactone. It's an off-label use, which means that the FDA didn't approve it for this use. They approved it for being a water pill. It's not very good at being a water pill, but they approved it for that reason. But the happy uh, side effect of it is, is that women don't get facial hair or acne. So I've, I've used this since the 80s yeah. with my teenage patients who were getting acne, and it would teenage females were getting acne. I'd put them on this, and it so would go away. So they weren't pellet patients. They no. were just, when you were a gynecologist yeah. and you saw when, teenagers. Right. They came in with complaints about acne, acne or facial hair. Right. You gave them spironolactone. Right. And then th then we had them, they'd go get it waxed it would or whatever, and then nothing came back. Yeah. So we would keep them on this until they could go on the pill. Sometimes. So you say to some of your older women who yes. now are getting testosterone replaced mm -hmm. and they had a, an adolescent history of facial hair mm -hmm. or acne, mm -hmm. you say to them, it's back, <laughs> or yeah. it's going. It's likely or it to might come be, back. It will probably come so back. So remember when you used to take spironolactone? Mm -hmm. You're going to have to take it again. And so, like I, when I was a teenager, I had a lot of facial hair. I'm Italian, so half Italian, so facial hair, leg hair, whatever. I had a lot of that, but I never had acne. So it's a, it's the receptor sites for the testosterone. And DHT is what testosterone changes into that affects facial hair and acne. For those, they responded differently. The, the, I did not get the sebaceous gland acne stuff, but I got the facial hair. So you can have one without the other, but this stops both of them. So I, I try to prepare people to take this if they've ever had it and then to tell them, so don't worry about it. Using we, your own history, if mm -hmm. you're taking testosterone pellets now, mm -hmm. are you more likely to get facial hair as a concern or would you possibly get acne? Since well, you've never be, had it before. I'd be more likely to get facial hair and not acne. Because you only get what you used to have. Right. Okay. So so it's it's genetically sensitive areas of your body that are more sensitive. Yeah. And sebaceous glands are the ones that are underneath the acne uh, breakouts. And is there a negative cost, side effects, a concern about taking spironolactone? The only thing is if if women don't drink water or don't drink enough fluids during the day, it can make them very dry and it's not good for their kidneys. But... If they drink enough water, it doesn't have any effect. Okay. I've been taking them for 17 years. So, I mean, there's no change in my kidney function. And, and it is truly a cosmetic concern more than a health concern. Right. I it mean, is. Culturally, if the message is we don't like hairy women right, or hairy-faced women, mm -hmm. then a lot of women are, are panicky around, I, I've got some hair. Well, yeah, and the, and the women who But it's never, not like a beard. It's like no. random hair that will grow. No, it's, or it's just like a, it looks like like tiny little Over your lip. hair that looks like a shadow, or uh -huh. you might get one hair, hair here or whatever, but we don't want them, that hair. I mean, when I was younger, I'd just bleach it so that you couldn't see the, you know, the, yeah. the you couldn't see it really. I wouldn't wax it. So you also have uh, a spa practice mm -hmm. that does cosmetic treatments for women. Right. And if you have dark hair, we can have it removed with a laser so that it won't come back. And we ha also have acne treatments. So is, that is that with or without taking spironolactone? I mean, if they have a concern about, oh, I don't know if I want to take something else. I mean, I, yeah, I hear a they, lot of people say that. Then they have to do something else if they don't want to have facial hair. So they're right. going to have to wax every month or they're going to have to get some kind of treatment to get rid of the facial hair. But and, you, and but you have, we have that. the arrangement for that if, That's if right. they need that. That's right. And, okay. and most people think that testosterone is worth it for all of the health benefits and yeah. how they feel, that it's worth getting the facial hair taken care of. I mean, some people even just tweeze. Yeah. So, yes, that's the biggest drawback to testosterone, actually. That's what the FDA thought was a big drawback for a testosterone patch, so they didn't pass it. Facial hair. It's cosmetic. So hair is a complex issue for women altogether. Mm -hmm. yes. I mean, facial hair is yeah. a concern. 
and again, depending on their culture of origin, mm -hmm. different body hair. Mm -hmm. But a lot of women are really worried as they age about hair loss on their head. Right. So can and you talk about that as so, it relates to testosterone pellets? So <clears throat> hair loss on, on your head is genetics. If you had mothers, grandmothers that had thin or balding hair, yeah. basically um, as they age, that's genetic. You can fight it by taking estrogen. Estrogen helps your hair grow. Testosterone itself helps your hair grow. But DHT, one of the byproducts of testosterone, can make your hair be, you know, you can have more of a, of a uh, hair loss in the temples and the top of your head. Those two areas are testosterone sensitive and DHT sensitive. So, so when the T becomes DHT in those areas, you can have hair loss here and here as a female. Now, if you have hair loss all over your head, it's not testosterone. In general, it's thyroid, or uh, that's the most common reason, or it's not, not enough estrogen, and especially my patients who can't take estrogen for some reason. They have frontal hair loss. So, but if you have if you have hair loss all over your head or breakage of your hair, so it kind of looks frizzy, then that's usually thyroid or high cortisol. So we have to actually look for things that are causing hair loss. And in general, most we find other things that are causing it, not testosterone. Oftentimes, people come to us with hair loss, right? And they as still a symptom, as a it. symptom, and they still have it. Yeah. Um, but this isn't what's causing it. And they'll forget that they had it before. So then you check thyroid. Or we check all of these different things. DHT. Right. And you can do a blood test on those? On DHT, yes. But you can't tell if the hair here is actually absorbing the, the DHT or changing T into DHT at the hair follicle level unless you have a biopsy. And a dermatologist is required for that. Okay. So that's that's how we, we send so at the very end, we will refer out yeah. to get a biopsy <laughs> if somebody's really worried about, or we use different kind of combinations of uh, minoxidil, which is uh, one of the topical treatments you can rub into your scalp, or we use estrogen creams that you can rub into your scalp. Some of these things are, are not systemic. They're just topical. You try, you try to get rid of the DHT from the hair follicle itself. You don't ever recommend run? Faux peels, spray on hair? No, I don't. <laughs> Not in general. My patients wouldn't do that. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, that would that would be... Um, I've, I've actually I just seen don't a commercial think they for do that. that. Yeah. Although there is some, some stuff for roots, you know, to cover your roots, which I have to confess I've used. Yeah. <laughs> My hair grows so fast now that, you know, it's it just like roots one day, no roots one day, one roots the next. So another concern that that women have, an anxiety that mm -hmm. women have, but in reality is a concern for only a very few women. And, mm -hmm. yeah. and that is that if they take testosterone, their voice will deepen. Right. Is that a real concern? I mean, does, does that happen ever? What, what's the statistical it's, chance it's of that? It's rare. We, I mean, we, we see 150 people in our office a week, mm -hmm. and we see this maybe twice a year. Yeah. So it's not very common. And it's normally a sensitivity for people that are in the media profession. Right. And they're in they're a profession singing they or need, speaking or something. Right. Their we, voice is their income. We try to ask people what they do for a living, but what we don't capture sometimes is they sing in the choir. Ah. Okay. <clears throat> sometimes that's an issue. But it, we haven't had that many people. And in general, they immediately think it's testosterone, and we find out that it's reflux, that they've they've damaged their vocal cords by having reflux. And in one patient, she had had damaged her, her vocal cords long ago mm -hmm. and she was having reflux and it caused more damage. So it wasn't the testosterone at all. So many, most of the times out of those few times a year, we hear this about half the times it's not testosterone. Okay. So and it is reversible. That's the other thing. It is reversible in general. If it is testosterone and we lower the dose or we hold the dose for six months, then the voice comes back, back to the pitch it used to be. Okay. It's not a radical change. It's not a permanent change. Mm -hmm. It's rare. Mm -hmm. And it most often is caused by something other than testosterone. Yes, that's right. So what we've learned is that it's a dance. As you move forward taking testosterone pellets, you may have some of these concerns by nature of social expectations or by nature of your own receptor sites. 
but they are adjustable and treatable and the long-term benefits of getting testosterone patients for replacement pellets for most of our patients is worth the cost of these uh, awarenesses. Thank you. Well, thank you for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.